This is Trepwire Week in Review for week ending April 14th, 2023. I'm Martha Kocher with Trep, a data modeling and analytics firm for the CMDS, commercial real estate, and CLO markets. I'm with Manis Clancy, Senior Managing Director, and Lonnie Hendry, Head of CRE and Advisory Services. This week, attention turns to big bank earnings and guidance for the economic outlook, while investors digested data released, which gives both sides of the rate hike debate something to cling to. Consumer inflation came in cooler than expected, with some pockets of stickiness, while wholesale inflation marked the biggest decline in three years. Manis, on the heels of last week's jobs number, which showed wage gains slowing, it does seem that inflation is on the right trajectory without crashing the economy. Yes, I think that's absolutely right. I think it was a great week in general for the markets. I think what we got, as you pointed out, were two benign inflation readings. CPI was more or less in line. I mean, uncomfortably high is where it's kind of leveling off, but um, it came in at or slightly lower than expectations. PPI was considerably lower than expectations. Um, That was one great takeaway from this week. We saw a better than expected jobs report last week, which was also terrific. We are now more than 30 days past the SVB crisis. We haven't seen another bank fall out of bed yet, even though withdrawals from banks, deposit withdrawals have exceeded 300 billion. Volatility in the lending markets has really dropped considerably. We were seeing 50 and 100 basis point moves in CMBX on various days for triple B rated segments of those indices. That has gone away. That has become much more peaceful, less volatility in the derivatives market. And then lastly, we saw a couple of CMBS deals price, which we were very concerned over the last month that available capital between banks squirreling away assets and volatility keeping CMBS lenders on the sideline, that uh, capital availability would be really crunched. Um, While capital availability is not as high as we hope it would be, these are certainly green shoots and hopefully the beginning of a normalization of the market. So a lot of positives to take away from the week. Yeah, I would uh, echo the sentiment, Manus. I think this week was actually some really welcomed, you know, good news. Inflation still higher than where people want, but it's it's good to see the trajectory kind of coming in line with what we're expecting to see based on the Fed's moves. And so, you know, a couple of uh, things that you hit on, I'll add a little color to, you know, U.S. employers still had a strong pace of hiring in March. Uh, unemployment rate was back down to 3.5%. If you look at labor force participation, it ticked higher. About 81% of Americans that are you know, still considered in their prime working years are employed, which is the highest number since May of 2001. That was according to the last uh, jobs report. And the leisure and hospitality industry still is accounting for like the bulk of the employment gains. Uh, they just added about 72,000 jobs, mostly for positions you know, within the restaurant and the bar space. And jobless claims did rise for the first time in weeks. They ticked up 11,000 to 239,000. We talked last week on the pod about how some of those numbers are being recalculated uh, post COVID. And if we look at some of the, you know, deeper dive CPI stuff, a couple of things I found interesting this week, grocery prices declined in March uh, from the prior month. This was the first, you know, time that we've had a one month drop since September of 2020. And something that's been of, you know, a lot of topic and discussion and headlines over the last couple of months is egg prices, uh, which really kind of took off, no pun intended, based on the avian flu that drove the prices up. But they posted their biggest single month drop since 87. And then we've talked at length on the podcast about shelter and the component role it plays within the larger CPI number. So there were some interesting statistics from a Zillow report that came out concerning the big debate about shelter and the CPI. And so it says, according to Zillow, uh, typical asking rents remain elevated nationally. Their annual growth rate slowed to 6% in March, down from a record 17% in February of 22. So, you know, I think as we look longer term, as those shelter costs and the asking rents continue to come down, and that gets factored into the CPI going forward, but just as more affirmation that we're on the right track. So uh, those were some things that I took away this week. I know we have a lot of other market stories that we can talk through. One last thing, the Fed minutes I thought was really interesting. Uh, it seems like the sentiment around the Fed, and I'd like to get maybe Martha or Manis you to comment on this, but even last week, we were still hearing kind of towing the line from everybody in terms of a 25 basis point rate hike coming forward. And it seems like now, based on some of the news they've heard this week, that 
some of the Fed members are starting to uh, walk that back a little bit. So I think it'll be interesting to see if they take a pause now. I think that could really turbocharge some of the market activity. I, I think they've gotten the ammunition this week. They got what they needed. The markets are telling them that they think peak in inflation is behind us. Certainly the two-year treasury yield and the 10-year treasury yield both being considerably lower than where they were at their peaks. That is evidence that many market watchers, many investors believe that peak inflation is behind us. I also think that, you know, these two back-to-back -back reports, CPI and PPI, were so benign, especially the PPI, that the Fed can look at this and say, uh, mission accomplished. Right. Powell can put on his jumpsuit and, you know, land on the uh, the deck of the aircraft carrier and say, we've done it. We've pulled it off. Mission accomplished. Whether we have or not, I'm not sure. I think the tea leaves are are looking good. I think that we've seen prices continue to level off and drop. I think on that front, we certainly are pointing in the right direction and the worst may be over. And I think that's a great thing. I do remain concerned about lending conditions. I'm not sure we've seen uh, the last of it from the banks. I do think that there will be some more nasty surprises. Uh, Warren Buffett actually said that this week as well. Uh, that could add new volatility into the market down the road. But as I said in the open, it was a lot of good things happening this week. And investors should feel a lot better now about conditions than they did 30 days ago. You talked about the banks and the comments from Berkshire Hathaway's Warren Buffett. Jamie Dimon also weighed in, basically saying that the weight on the scales is in favor of a recession after seeing what happened with the collapsed bank. And we're going to have big banks like JP Morgan Wells and City all report their Q1 earnings tomorrow. And a lot of people are going to be watching not just for the results, but what their guidance and their outlook is for the coming quarters. Yeah, I mean, I think the things we're looking for tomorrow is, have they seen a compression in their uh, margins? Are they paying more for deposits? Uh, we may not know that yet because we're only really, we only had two weeks between the failure of SBB and the end of the quarter. So there's not a lot of evidence there. It may be something that is more of a concern or uh, something that shows up more dramatically in the next quarter. But I would think that they would want to get ahead of that. So to your point, Martha, they will probably talk about whether or not their margins are getting compressed. They will probably talk about what is happening to their lending book, if they're being as aggressive in lending or if they're pulling back. But let's not forget that the banks that you mentioned are the top four. They will not be representative of the Huntingtons, the Comericas, the Regions, the m ts that may come out with vastly different results. The top four banks might be feeling incredibly frisky right now. They were beneficiaries of a wave of new deposits. Their story might be certainly glass half full, and we may find as the quarter goes on, there's more glass half empty stories that emerge. So uh, we'll watch that carefully. And of course, one of the things that was the downfall for Silicon Valley was the unrealized losses. Trip has done some analysis on what that looks like in Q1 for banks. Yeah, so we have a, a report that we've come out with uh, looking at what, what Martha just talked through. And what some of the interesting takeaways here, you know, longer term interest rates which were really some of the, the cause behind some of those unrealized losses have moderated in recent weeks, which translate you know, into a pretty significant quarterly improvement in the bank's securities values, which relieves some of the pressure on their capital ratios. So that's something um, you know, we're saying is gonna be noticeable across the sector. And I'll give some numbers here in just a second. It doesn't mean we're out of the woods yet, but it definitely means some of the immediate pressure maybe is off. So we estimate that bank securities Holdings got about a $100 billion boost in Q1, and this is due to the 10-year and five-year Treasury yields falling uh, 40 basis points and 39 basis points, respectively. And then the one-year Treasury yield fell by about nine basis points. So what this means is the held to maturity securities value increased by an estimated $53 billion or so, which was a measurable 2% or so improvement from Q4, and then available for sale securities increased by about $46 billion. So what this means is just, you know, instead of sitting on 600 plus billion dollars worth of unrealized losses, like they were at the end of Q Q4, you know, we're looking at probably a more aggregate number of just over 500 billion of unrealized losses. So if you want to get the full narrative on this and get the charts and graphs and all the cool stuff that comes in our reports, just feel free to reach out at podcast at trep.com and we'll be happy to share a copy of that report with you. But 
to Manis's point, I mean, I don't think we're out of the woods yet, but it definitely is a little bit of breathing room, whereas a month ago, we weren't sure we were going to have. So Manis, one of the things you talked about in your upbeat sentiment is that CMBS deals are pricing. Yes, we did see two. One was a BBCMS deal, 2023 C19, and a benchmark mortgage trust, 2023 B38. The fact that anything priced right now is great. We had seen a real void in this market. We have talked about it before. We were hopeful that the void wouldn't last too long. And seeing these two deals price is a real vote of confidence for the market that volatility has diminished and issuers are comfortable bringing deals to market. For those that are looking to mark their positions to market, we do have some indications. For one of the deals, the 10-year AAA bond cleared at the thread of about 200 basis points over the swap curve. The other was about 215 basis points over the swap curve. So if you do the math, what you're saying with a 3.4% treasury or thereabouts, a 10-year AAA bond now is yielding somewhere between 540 and 555. That would be your benchmark. If you go down the credit curve, double A minus bonds for one of the issues was 340 basis points over the curve. For the other, it was 390. So if you split the difference, you're talking about probably a yield of in the sevens for double A paper, double A minus paper for the single A. 475 and 525. So if you split the difference, 500 basis points over the curve for single A minus rated securities, you're talking about a yield of 840, something like that. That's where you're probably marking these things if you're concerned about getting an accurate level on where these things might trade. We've also seen a number of accounts of private lenders stepping into the CRE sector looking for opportunities. On the private lender space, Bloomberg had an article, this was put out by Carmen Arroyo and John Sage, you know, discussing private lenders stepping in to take on um, additional opportunities in the CRE sector. So I think if you look at this, and we've, we talked about this on the Market Pulse webinar that we did last month of, if you look at the share of loans being done outside of the traditional banking space, like private credit has been growing for some time. And I think this disruption in the market creates opportunity for them to uh, use their own capital to provide loans. Usually they can get more favorable terms on the lender side and charge a little bit more than banks, but they can be maybe more flexible. And I think when we had um, Warren DeHaan on, I mean, he was taking a very optimistic view of kind of that role that they can play to fill some of the void in the marketplace. And so I would agree that I think this is something we'll see as a growing sector. Um, and I think that's potentially accelerated for, for private lenders that are well capitalized to take advantage of today's market opportunities. I would agree. I think Warren was spot on that they are the winners in this, especially if you're funded with insurance company money, if you don't have to mark to market, if you don't have to deal with the redemption issues that Breach or Starwood have seen. Somebody always wins and somebody always loses. And in times of disruption, the guy who has dry powder, especially if that dry powder is easily deployed as these PE firms money can be at times, uh, could be the winner. I think that they are big acquirers of shares. And, you know, the only thing that could perhaps emerge as flies in the ointment would be either a really urgently enforced level of scrutiny from regulators. Certainly that would be problematic or one of these firms that is not funded by insurance company money blows up, right? That would change the prevailing wins, if you would, for the private equity firms. But right now they have a lot going for them. So let's get into office. There were a number of stories that were flying about. Firms trying to get employees back to the office. And some of them are tying being in the office to either performance appraisals or to compensation as a bit of a carrot and stick. Yeah, we've been talking about this for some time. We didn't know what shoe had to drop first, if it was going to be you know, layoffs or what the catalyst was going to be to get people back in the office. And we've seen a lot of these companies put out what have proven to be artificial dates of return to office, and they continue to push them back. But I think you know, with the prospects of recession becoming more and more likely and starting to see a little bit of the credit crisis and everything having an impact on on behavior, I think we're, we're going to see this return to office in full force. I mean, JP Morgan announced managing directors and senior leadership five days a week. I mean, that's a de much different position than what we've seen thus far. And I'm actually for it. I think 
I think it's good. Collaboration is a good thing. Getting people together in the same room is a good thing. And I think for us, you know, at TREP, we've had a really great run with a hybrid schedule, and I think that's beneficial, but at least it provides some office component. Tying it to compensation, performance reviews, uh, I think that's a move the needle for most folks. Like they hate the commute, but I, I really doubt people are going to be willing to give up money, even though they say they will. I have to say the work from home thing, you know, I'm older now, my kids are older. They're not kind of underfoot anymore. But I have to say, at one time, when I had three kids under the age of 20 months, I would so long for that commute. The minute I sat down on that Metro North train with a cup of coffee, the Wall Street Journal, and the New York Post, it was like all the mayhem kind of moved away and, and peace kind of re-entered my life. I can't imagine trying to, you know, as a young professional... You know, in my 30s, having three kids, three toddlers running around trying to get work done and thinking somehow that was less stressful than getting on a train for 30 minutes. I, you know, I don't really get it. Not to mention the fact that, you know, I always like being in the office. I like the water cooler talk, the sports talk, the, the general banter. But I'm with you, Lonnie. You know, and I'll add that, you know, when you go to the office and you put a bowling ball in somebody's luggage before they go on a business trip, it goes over a lot funnier than when you do it to your wife. It's not the same kind of reaction uh, when you pull one of those stunts in the office. We had a number of office stories that talked about price cuts, subleases, and ditching what is left of the last space. So this is where the happy talk that I started with pivots to the unhappy talk. A lot of negative office segments to follow. And I'll try to bracket them into uh, certain categories and let Martha and Lonnie weigh in as we go through each segment. So the first segment we'll talk about is subleasing. In Boston, this comes from the Boston Business Journal. Verizon has put 190,000 square feet out for sublease. This is in a 440,000 square foot property near the Boston Garden. So the property does not back any CMBS debt, but as we've said before, it doesn't have to to weigh on properties in that zip code. So 200,000 square feet coming up near the, the Boston Garden. In Seattle, Meta is putting out space 82,000 square feet at 929 Office Tower in Bellevue. This story comes from the downtown Bellevue network. Seattle, very hard hit in recent months from people giving back space. Salesforce, this is what Martha was referring to, it is putting its last remaining space at the tower that bears its name out for sublease. Uh, this was an exclusive by Laura Waxman of the San Francisco Business Times. Deloitte has confirmed that they are moving out of their office in Atlanta. They have 260,000 square feet at 191 Peach Tree. They are moving across town and they are cutting their space by about half. In Atlanta as well, which now has over 6 million feet of sublease space available. News came out just a few minutes ago that we ported on Trep Wire that Carvana is putting 550,000 square feet out for sublease. They took that space from State Farm in Dunwoody two years ago. Um, State Farm is on the hook for this lease until 2037. The property in question backs, I believe, about 160 million in CMBS debt. So no immediate risk to the bondholders of that property because State Farm is on the hook, but the loan does mature in August of 2024. And it will be interesting to see how lenders look at this. Will somebody refinance this knowing that the building is empty, even though State Farm is on the hook until 2037? But two negative stories for the Atlanta office showing that that sublease number just keeps going up, even in a strong market. Yeah, Atlanta, it was kind of a surprising, you know, addition to our sublease map that we put out a couple of months ago. And this is just two more stories that are not great for them. I wonder if we're going to be able to start buying some really cheap WeWork and Salesforce, you know, lighting signs off the side of these office buildings since they're not going to be occupying the space. If that's the case, maybe we could we could buy them, NFT them, maybe do something with that. Well, I'm terrified, Lonnie, that you're going to be giving away office buildings and your stocking stuffer during Secret Santa. But it's really piling up, you know, across the U.S. Every city seems to have record-setting 
amounts of sublease space available. The numbers keep going up and it's it's not a, a happy place right now. Yeah, I'm still not sure we've seen the full reset either on the rental rate side because the sublease space hasn't been absorbed at those reduced rates. And so I still think for the office sector, even with some of the positive, you know, return to work news, there's still going to be a pretty large bifurcation in rental rates between existing contract rents and newly identified sublease market rents. So segment number two that we'll talk about in the office market, but we will end with happy thoughts. Statuses on some big loans that we've been watching that either have forthcoming maturity dates or the maturity date has passed. So here's a couple for you. Again, not, not happy stories. This first one came from our sister company, Commercial Real Estate Direct. The Brookfield DTLA Fund Office Trust has missed the loan payment or plans to miss the loan payment on another Los Angeles office. Um, you could recall that in the past, they missed a payment on the gas company tower that that loan was gone to special servicing earlier this month. They now said that they plan to miss the April payment on the $275 million EY Plaza loan. The story gets even worse. This particular fund is backed by six offices and one retail property. Commercial Real Estate Direct is reporting that the firm is running a negative cash burn and has substantial doubt about the company's ability to continue as a going concern. So real negative story here. And what we pointed out in our, our own story as a follow-up to that is you have to consider that if they have negative burn elsewhere, what does that do for other offices for which they're accounting on cash flow from one office, supporting perhaps short-term interest shortfalls on another? So the one we highlighted was a property at 333 South Hope Street, the $400 million Bank of America Plaza loan. This particular loan matures in 2024. It backs a whole host of CMBX 8 debt. And you have to ask yourself, if this fund itself has to close down, if it, if it has a going concern moment, what happens to this loan? Do they just throw back the keys and that's it? We don't know. So something for CMBS investors to watch. Other things that we were watching this week, 330 Park Avenue. On Wednesday, we reported that the $485 million loan was transferred to special servicing. This used to be the Colgate Palmolive building. Colgate moved out, very little space there left for that firm. The borrower there in a positive sign has asked for a two-year extension. Their, their knee-jerk reaction was not giving the keys back, so maybe some hope there. Uh, in something that our Jack LaForge put out first thing this morning, April remittance data revealed that the $240 million, 600 California Street loan has gone 30 days delinquent and is now with a special servicer. What's the backstory here? The backstory is this was the building that WeWork occupied and bought. They bought and put into a fund that they established. I don't believe WeWork is there anymore. And now this loan is back with the special servicer. So that particular loan backs a single asset deal, one that we will be watching very carefully in months to come. And if I'm not mistaken, you have a positive story to tell. You're not going to believe it, Martha, but I have more positive stories than you can shake a stick at, right? We're going to run through these very quickly. 1740 Broadway, do you remember that one? L Brands. L Brands left. Blackstone said they were turning the keys. We thought this was going deed in lieu. This month, there are indications there may be a change of heart. The special service or workout code has flipped from foreclosure to extension this month. No sure thing. These things change from time to time. But the fact that we're now 13 months after Elbrans has left and Blackstone indicated that they were giving the keys back, it remains untransferred. It's still not REO. And now we have indications that maybe Blackstone is, is still in the game. A couple of other things here. Yahoo signs a 80,000 square foot lease in Mountain View. That comes from the real deal. Uh, in Houston, a couple of nice stories here. Jeffrey of the Houston Business Journal noted that Ford Energy and Blackstone Minerals both renewed headquarter leases in Houston. Together, those two leases total about 160,000 square feet. 
So great news there. In Dallas, Texas Instruments is looking for 200,000 square feet of office space, which will be net new on Great America Parkway in Santa Clara. Another great story there. And by the way, that last story, Dallas Business Journal, Olivia Peterkin, back in Houston, commercial property executive, Jordana Rothberg. Modec International has signed a 120,000 square foot lease for its headquarters on Memorial Drive. It's at West Memorial Place One. It's a 331,000 square foot building owned by Skanska. And that building now has a new 120,000 square foot tenant. That is all the good news I have at the moment. Yeah, it's great to hear some positive office stories. I think we're we're actually starting to see some transaction activity pick back up in that sector, even if it's in the form of extensions or refinances and other things that we haven't seen for the last couple of months. So I think we're the narrative of everything is doom and gloom is starting to slightly shift where we're seeing certain pockets and certain geographies come back to life a little bit. So I think that's a that's a great takeaway for this week. Macro and some of the office sector stuff seems to be on a slight but positive uptick. Some good news there. I mean, I think the thing we haven't seen yet in any kind of bulk is the resetting and the negative sales. We did have one this week, which was that Griffin Towers building in Santa Clara, which was sold for $82 million, $47 million less than where it's sold, I think, in 2014. So I think we'll have more of that to come. So for those that you know think we've turned the corner and there's a lot more hunky-dory coming for the rest of the year in the office, is probably, I think, twice about that. But there were some, some nice stories this week, and we're always happy to report them. So turning to retail, retail sales are going to be out tomorrow, and forecasts are predicting a drop in headline retail sales. And you may have seen a UBS analyst is predicting more store closures accelerating in the coming years. He's estimating about 20,000 in the next four years as a result of a drop in consumer spending, credit tightening, and more online shopping. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm more bullish than, than some of the people out there in terms of the number of store closings we're going to see. I do believe, and I've said this before, the era of big store closing announcements is over. If you live through e-commerce, if you lived through COVID, you like your store, you believe in it, you're going to keep it. Now, there's certain pockets where that's not true. Pharmacies have been a disaster for a long time. We've seen the bankruptcies or near bankruptcies of Bed Bath & Beyond and Party City. There'll still be those stories, but I just don't see this, you know, 100 store list of JC Penney's closing, you know, once a year. I, I think we're past that. I do believe, and I think you have a couple of stories on this topic, Martha and Lonnie, that the big narrative for the next five years will be, they will be heavily tilted what store closings we see towards quality of life cities, places where the quality of life has spiraled in the negative direction. Yeah, I agree with everything you've said, Manis. I think the folks that were able to pivot during COVID, they like where they're at now. They've got some combination of an omni-channel retail presence. They feel like they're probably stronger and more uh, well positioned now than they have been ever. And so I think retail on the whole is actually in a really good place. And I think to that, you know, the UBS, I think they said 20,000 store closures by 2027. It looks like we're averaging about 2,000 store closures a year now. So, I mean, that's a pretty big leap to get to that number. And I don't see that happening unless something dramatic changes. And it's interesting because a lot of retailers have actually started to diversify some of their portfolios. Like we've seen you know, some of these lower cost retailers, Five Below, Pop Shelf, and others that have announced really large expansion plans across the U.S. So I think retail will be an interesting asset class because it has had some really rough days. But I think looking forward, it's actually pretty well positioned in today's current environment. Man, as you mentioned, quality of life impacting where stores are going to be closing. And I think we have uh, a couple of stories, or at least one, where that is actually already, in fact, happening. Yeah, the the big one this week was, um, I think the San Francisco Standard was the first to report this, Josh Cohn and Garrett Leahy, that the Whole Foods at 8th and Market, which has only been open for a year, is closing down. Uh, and the narrative that went with that, horrible street conditions, safety of the workers, it really painted a very dire picture of that, that area in San Francisco that's kind of southwest of Union Square. So, you know, commercial real estate is an ecosystem. And even though this Whole Foods doesn't back any particular debt that we know of, it does speak to the likelihood of 
office tenants in that area, renewing leases, getting people back to the office. So a real negative for that part of the city, which has been hammered by firms pulling out terrible headlines in terms of crime and homelessness and so forth. Um, this is just of a piece. The other story I was hinting at before, Walmart announced it was pulling out of half of its locations in Chicago, closing four stores, which it claims had been losing tens of millions of dollars a year. One of those loans backs a CMBS loan, a 2020 note. But Walmart, you know, it, it's just like San Francisco that they're pointing towards crime, quality of life, theft, and so forth. And I don't think we've, we've seen far from the end of this. I think more and more and more firms will use this not as an excuse. They'll use it as a reason for saying, we're going to pull out of this market. We just cannot keep our margins up. The neighborhoods are shrinking because of the crime. We're dealing with loss of inventory and it's hard to get workers here. So uh, I think that will be one of the themes for retail for the rest of the year. Yeah, I think it's interesting when you look at that. Some of those statistics or metrics, you know, crime and other things were usually associated with residential development and where people were going to reside and send their kids to school and so forth. And now we've seen that spill over into like the urban core and impact office buildings and retailers and other segments of the market. And it's kind of, it's, it's disheartening to, a, to an extent. We can't get things in order so that people can feel safe in these really what used to be vibrant communities. And so hopefully we can get things situated so these retailers can have people feel safe coming to work and people will feel safe coming into those stores and buying things. You know, I, I say this to my kids all the time. I don't know if it resonates or not, but it's really true. It's really how I feel. Because sometimes, you know, young people, people in college and so forth, they have this image that if inventory is stolen, or a company pulls out, well, it's a big company, they make a lot of money, their CEO is paid a lot, their white collar workers get paid a lot, big deal, right? Probably a lot of it is covered by insurance. And what I try to explain to them is, while that may be true, the person that always feels the impact is at the lowest end of the economic sector. They're the person working at the checkout. They rely on this for their job. They rely on this for their their food, for their medical, you know, their, their prescriptions and so forth. And, you know, when we had COVID, the wealthy in San Francisco, they went to Idaho, they went to Montana, right? They left. And what you were left with is, you know, the people that couldn't afford to leave. And, and it's always that part of the economic curve that suffers the most. So for people out there, and I don't think our listeners are in this category, I think they're, they're smarter than the average human being by a wide, wide mile. But I think they know this, but, you know, it's always the people in the bottom 25% that, that take it on the chin. Yeah, and you don't realize like Whole Foods and Walmart, those probably employ two to 500 people at each location, plus all the residual employees with delivery drivers and other things that actually stock the store. So to your point, they are a pretty large component of, you know, an economic driver for a local community, especially for that lower tier, you know, socioeconomic class. Well, I was going to say, I think three of the stores that are closing are in Chicago's South and West Side neighborhoods. So access to groceries and retail now becomes a bigger problem for that neighborhood. Yeah, I, I think our leaders have let us down. You know, we have a lot of things that we should be able to agree on. Leaders from the right side and the left side should be able to agree on. And one of those things should be able to provide lower income inner city families with a safe place to live and shop. And it, the fact that people on either side are throwing mud at each other when there's crime going on and, and so forth is, is just so disheartening and disappointing. We had a number of trading alerts on malls that were either refinanced, loans extended, values cut in half. We have a whole potpourri of stories there. Yeah, and, and not all of them are bad. We have, in fact, the good outweigh the bad by two or three to one. So. I will start with the bad, and that is um, the Bridgewater Commons. You know, Martha didn't do her part. She didn't go there enough. She didn't buy enough clothes or restock her children's wardrobe. And because of that, Bridgewater Commons, the value of that mall was cut substantially. It was valued at $570 million in 2012. Um, because of Martha alone, the value this month was lowered to $204 million. Sadly, this property backs a $300 million dollar CMBS loan, which is now about a third underwater and is, we'll probably see three or four tranches of debt on that 
asset wiped out in full should this loan be resolved at that price. On the more positive side, two stories from the Chattanooga Times Free Press, both related to CBL. The first one is that CBL has refinanced uh, the Friendly Center and the shops at Friendly Center in Greensboro, North Carolina. A great story there because we've said that capital really isn't available for malls, but sometimes it is. And in this case, CBL was able to refinance that loan. We love that. CBL Part 2, the West County Center, which backs a $160.7 million loan, has been extended. That particular loan backs CMBX 6. It's part of a 2013 deal. And... In return for a $5 million balance reduction, the borrower was able to extend the loan for two years. Lastly, we found out that GGP was able to extend a loan for 18 months that is backed by three malls. It's a 2018 deal. A modification had been rumored for some time. Look for that in tomorrow morning's TREP wire. Um, a big modification that will push that debt out for a couple of years. So some really nice stories in the mall space. Mall operators continue to lean in and fight for their properties, and that is beneficial. And we're going to finish up with a couple of multifamily stories that have some tie-ins to affordable housing. Yes. For those that have listened over the last month, we noted that when Signature Bank was taken over, they had a big portfolio of uh, rent-stabilized, rent-controlled apartments in Manhattan. They were seized by the FDIC. There were some very negative headlines about these properties, some brokers calling them toxic and so forth. Newmark has been brought in to market these properties, um, but it does seem to be a very, very weak part of the market right now. And some of these landlords, I think, are going to suffer from really painful sticker shock coming down the road. Two pieces of data we saw this week. One was a, an offering in the Bronx of a 16 building portfolio that ended up getting sold. But in the offering memorandum, the cap rate that was being offered for this portfolio was 718 on an in-place basis, 790, if I remember correctly, on a pro forma basis. So what do you think about that, Lonnie? Caps in the sevens for multifamily. What, what is your your hot take on that? Yeah, I mean, I, well, I think qualifying it as affordable is required here just because nobody really knows, especially in markets that have pretty strict rent control place and probably over time will become more and more restrictive. I would personally be leery of buying those types of assets just because, you know, the ability to raise rents is going to continue to get squeezed and the increase in expenses are going to continue to rise faster than what you can pass through on the rent. So, you know, I think I have really no feel for what a Bronx affordable housing complex should sell for. I mean, seven compared to what we know about conventional market rate multifamily is significantly higher, but I would actually probably think this is a fairly aggressive cap rate for a deal with limited upside, in my opinion, over the long term. So probably a great trade for the person getting out from under it. And hopefully the buyer knows something that I don't know that makes them feel like this is a viable going concern into the future. Yeah, I, I should be more precise with this. The offering price was 60 million, and that's where the cap rates were indicative of. The actual sale price was 65 million. So this was probably done you know, for under seven cap when you kind of readjust for the price that it went for. So even more aggressive, than the numbers that we were banding about. But I do think that, you know, you see these transactions taking place. And if you are one of these banks that operates in New York, I think you have to take that as gospel, right? You have to say that anybody looking to refinance debt that we have there, right? The the mark that you're using, the benchmark, is a cap of seven or, or higher. There was another property, two properties that sold in Washington Heights, which is the northernmost part of Manhattan. It was... Uh, the scene of a great play years ago in the Heights by Lynn Manuel Miranda, if I'm remembering that correctly, a terrific playwright and a really great play. But in any event, 3850 and 3900 Broadway sold in the last couple of weeks for $20 million. That was $7 million less than where the property sold for in 2014. So a really sizable decline for that benchmark as well. So I do think the FDIC is going to have a hard time getting a lot of value out of this portfolio. And I do think there's going to be sticker shock for landlords as well as for property lenders in that area. It's probably the weakest part of the country as far as I can tell right now. 
Yeah, the size of that portfolio is a, another problem for them trying to offload it. I mean, I think they said, what, 11 billion of affordable in a pretty concentrated geographic region. I mean, it's, it's just a really tough ticket to move at this point. So, you know, it's good that we got some market intel here. I mean, it's nice to see transactions, you know, whether this is scalable, I think we'll see. And as we mentioned a couple of weeks ago on the signature portfolio, I wouldn't be shocked if we see some sort of government play here where those units actually get sold off to some affordable housing providers um, on the government side. So definitely something we'll be keeping an eye on going forward. Well, you talked about this. You reminded me of something else with regard to the getting rid of a big portfolio. We didn't talk about this before, but it is something to keep our eye on. All right. Now it's shout out time. We had a bunch on Twitter, Chris H, Matt R, Celia R, Dan M, and Shlomo C. And on LinkedIn, a number of comments at us, the counselors of real estate, Timothy S, Darren H, and Stephen J had some comments on LinkedIn. And a number of other people reached out. Charles B. and L had some comments. She's based in London and shared some hotel article news that she had. Jason S, Jeremy C, and Alexander L, who's a student at San Diego, had some information that he was looking for. And you guys have seen the news about the AI generated version of the Joe Rogan podcast. I did see that, that I didn't see the output. I did see the headline that somebody used AI to create a Joe Rogan television show, I guess, or a podcast, I guess, whatever it is. If there's a, um, if there's a trip wire version of that, and if there's, there's a content creator, maybe they could share it with us. I'd be really interested. How do you know that it's not happening right now? How do you know that I'm not out on the golf course and. I'm four steps ahead of you, Martha. That would be kind of cool. It's the AI version of Manus right now. Lonnie's here in real life, though, and he's mute. I said I'm always here and not smart enough for that AI stuff, or evidently my microphone. Um, so uh, maybe maybe <laughs> the podcast would probably see a significant uptick if uh, you had the AI version of Lonnie here. My goal is to scam the AI to put something out there that is so ridiculous about commercial real estate that I just take away all its credibility whatsoever, so nobody ever tries to replace me. That's 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 my goal for the weekend. I think you've already done it. You're good. And with that, we'll close. Thanks to our producer this week, Riley Cox. Good luck, Riley. It'll be it'll be an interesting one. Join us next week as we look at what's happened during the week and how it may be impacting you. If you have a question, a comment, send your email to podcast at trep.com and subscribe to the podcast with your favorite provider. Thank you for listening and stay well. All right.